Welcome everyone to the 2014 Affiliate Summit. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the six secrets of the six-figure affiliate blogger. Uh, I have some great panelists with me today and they're gonna answer a lot of questions uh, for you and as well as for me. But uh, before we begin, we've got a couple of housekeeping rules that I wanna go over. First of all, um, there is no videotaping of this event. Uh, basically, rule you're allowed to take as much pictures as you want, but uh, if you're gonna videotape, uh, please no more than one minute. You're, when you came in here, you were given a survey card. Uh, these are feedback they give to Affiliate Summit that they judge and they use for future events, so please do fill that out and uh, give, give us all a 10. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this will be a Q&A session. I will be asking uh, questions from a panel, but halfway through it, you will be given an opportunity to answer questions as well. And since we are recording these sessions, we ask that you come up to the mic at the center of the aisle there to ask your question when the time comes. I'll ask you to come up. And so, let's begin by just introducing our panel here. And uh, I'm gonna ask basically each one of our panel to say something about, about themselves and uh, where they come from and uh, what they do. So let's begin with my media right. My friend Syed, who, as far as I know, uh, makes more money than all of us combined. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Syed Balki. I'm the founder of WP Beginner, uh, which is one of the largest free WordPress resource site. I also run a fairly popular entertainment blog called List25. Uh, we're going at 50 to 80,000 new subscribers a month, have uh, over 80 million video views. Um, I have a bunch of products. One of the new ones that we launched is called Optin Monster, and I can probably go on, but I don't want to hog the mic, so that's it. <laughs> I'm John Rampton, uh, best known as an entrepreneur. Um, I am the managing editor of Search Engine Journal and also the owner of Organizing Ventures. I'm Zach Johnson. I blog at ZachJohnson.com. I've been in this industry for 18 years and I'm also working with Brand.com and that's pretty much it. All right. And I'm your moderator, John Chow, and I run the blog JohnChow.com. So let's just get right down to it. Basically, uh, instead of starting with successes, I want to talk about mistakes that you've made in your blogging career. And I'd like to give you an example of one I made. And actually, my biggest mistake, believe it or not, is just choosing my domain name. When I first started, uh, when I got into blogging, I decided that the easiest way was just to go in and just start a blog. So I just took my domain name, johnshow.com, and turned that into a blog, and looking back at it, that was probably one of my most costly financial mistakes because the blog is, does great volume, makes great money, but I can't sell it. I can't sell it, and unless another John Shell buys it, I really can't sell it. So, and, so I, I, my recommendation to you is that if you're gonna start a blog, maybe spend a little time thinking on a, on a more traditional business trade name so you can have an exit strategy down the road. <laughs> so how about you, Sayed? Uh, I mean, dang, so many mistakes. That's how I learn every day. Uh, one of my earlier mistakes that I made was playing the search engine game where, you know, you try to manipulate search and try to rank high just for just about every keyword. And I've done it, I used to do it, you know, I've been doing it since 02, so uh, did it on several sites and it was pretty easy back then. And, you know, when, whenever something seems too, you know, easy and too good to be true, it really is. Uh, it's, it's, you know, there's no, there's no magic pill. Google will get you, so don't try to play that game. Uh, obviously, now, you know, after I learned my lesson in what, 07, I st stopped like playing that game altogether and, you know, <laughs> just playing by the book, keep, you know, creating quality content and that has helped. So, uh, my biggest mistake, um, I would say, is allowing uh, not the best content on my site. Uh, in the beginning days, I sometimes would drop, write posts that uh, weren't anything but the best. Uh, they took you know, minimal amounts of time, or I paid people to write them that didn't word them the best, and I'm regretting it every day because those posts still rank, and I still get called out for them all the time. You can update them. It's pretty easy yeah, in WordPress. I, I, it, yeah, well, especially when you write for Swiss in your journal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we have updated them. SEOs are a little smarter than that. Uh, one of the problems I had was uh, 
I guess it's a time management issue or just too much going on. I was reviewing a piece of software that was uh, syndicating different articles and I left it on one of my other blogs that I forgot about and it grabbed some copyrighted article and threw it on my website. And then I had a team of lawyers come after me and try and sue me for a few hundred thousand dollars. It resulted in uh, about $7,500 to get them away, but still that article didn't make me a single cent or get me any traffic, so it was just not being aware of a situation, so always be on your toes. Wow, yeah. I can really echo uh, Syed's sentiment about just trying to you know, play by the rules and not gaming the search engine. Uh, I used to do that a lot myself, and uh, I was actually, for three years of my blog's life, I was actually nuked from Google uh, because I was basically pushing them, trying to, I did a Google bomb, but trying to rank for the term, make money online. And I was ranked number one, but it created a lot of havoc through other webmasters reporting me and stuff. And as a result, Google nuked me. And I was off the search engine for three years. When you search for John Chow, you got John Cow. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, I am Google friendly now, Google compliant, and uh, we're, we're in good terms again. I am back on the search engine. So, uh, yeah, if I can give you one piece of advice in that space, just play by the rule. Uh, you can game the engine, and you might artificially inflate yourself a little while, but they will eventually catch you. Right. So, continue along. What one piece of advice for someone starting out? Like, we have uh, uh, how many people have blogged as relatively new? All right, so. so, you know, for our new people here, you know, what one piece of advice would you give our, our new bloggers, you know, to help them be successful? Okay, so, you know, every time I start a blog, you know, before, a, lot, a lot of times I notice that beginners just dive straight in without doing any research or any, any type of, you know, planning. So plan out who you're really writing for. Who's your target audience? And actually go as detailed as possible in that reader profile so you can add as much value um, to that reader. If, if your purpose is to entertain like teenagers, then make sure you have the content to entertain teenagers, not like something that will bore them to death. Um, so that's my biggest advice and, and one thing that I follow you know, for every, every project that I start is um, create as detailed a reader profile as possible um, and that has helped me succeed. Uh, my piece of advice would be to be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, if you're not passionate, you are going to stop working. Um, literally, I mean, even before you look into what they're going to talk about this, make sure that you can blog about this for hours on end without making any money for like a long time, and you're okay with that. <laughs> I mean, literally, just plan on, you know, a couple hours a day for the rest of your life not making anything. If you're still all right with doing that, I you think found you'll... Your topic. Yeah. Yeah, I think you found your topic and you'll start succeeding because of that. Yeah, and before you start a blog, if you're planning on making money with it, do some research because if you're passionate about cutting grass or something <laughs> ridiculous, you can blog about it all you want. I like How cutting grass, personally. Yes. Yeah, there's not going to be a way for you to monetize that. So another piece of advice is whatever you're good at, be awesome at it and be known for that. I'm known for being in the affiliate marketing space and I've been able to propel my blog over the past seven years into my own blog brand for ZachJohnson.com, which has got me on TV, speaking around the world and everything else. So I'm not selling physical products or services, but I am my own brand now. So whatever you're awesome at, turn that into a brand. Mm -hmm. All right. That, that's a good way, that's a good segue into my next question, which is monetization. Like, what else, what's working for you guys in terms of how do you monetize your traffic? You want me to start? Yeah, sure. So monetization varies from the type, type of site that you have. So on, if, if, you, if you're going after, you know, just mass traffic like we are on List 25, the best way to monetize is through advertisement. But if, if you are on a more of a niche site in a, in a fitness industry like Steady Strength, or if you're on a, on a target site like WP Beginner, like you're better, you're better off um, you know, working on affiliate deals or even, even like services and products because you don't have millions and millions of impressions that you, know, you can sell on a CPM base. But if you have 100 targeted users and 30 of them are actually going to buy something from you and you can get a 25% cut off that, it's going to make you a lot more money than getting like $2 for a CPM or $3 or even $10. We sell on Search Engine Journal, we do AdSense. 
uh, AdSense accounts for about a third of our revenue. We do buy sell ads. Buy sell ads accounts for about another third of our product of our revenue. And the rest is working with brands and doing co-sponsoring of events and stuff like that. That's also a great way to work with companies uh, to sponsor different categories and sections of our blog. Uh, I'm going to go back to branding again. Even if every traffic source goes away, you're advertising on Facebook ads, that disappears, that's not working. You go into media buying, that disappears. Whatever it is, you always have your brand. So every affiliate network could disappear, but another business is going to come out. So I've established myself as an authority so I can always have somebody that's coming to me with a new opportunity. So while I don't have products that I'm actually pushing on people or monthly recurring income, I always have new opportunities coming to me at every angle. So it allows me to work with companies of all scale and always expanding my own brand in the process. Yeah, uh, for my blog, uh, chanchao.com, what I do is um, I look at what my readers need and they come here, they come to my blog to learn how to blog. So I usually package my offerings around the assumptions that they're here to learn how to start a blog. And I believe the easiest way to sell something is to teach it. So I'm not with teaching sales. And so I don't try to sell them anything. I try to teach them, like, you want to start a blog? I will help you start a blog. And then I will recommend solutions to them so they can achieve that goal. And if I make money with that recommendation, whether it be an affiliate commission or my own product, all the better. And that's how I go about monetizing. So when someone comes to my blog, the first thing they do is they get offered a free ebook download that teaches them how to start a blog. And then they will get uh, an autoresponder sequence uh, uh, down the road that says, well, let's get you started. Obviously, if you want to start a blog, you're going to need web hosting. So I'm hosted by HostGator, and I, they've been good to me. And I recommend if you want to start a blog, you can get hosted by HostGator, and they go sign up. I make money. And down the road, they'll need stuff like email lists. They'll need stuff. Uh, I recommend various uh, monetization channels like Google or Cantera, in which case I will get a commission from them, like a head ending fee. So doing it that way is no pressure, teaching sales, and the conversion is much, much higher. So just look at the niche that you're in and package around a series of products that you can offer them or recommend to them. And you'll find that that converts a lot better than just putting up a banner or just trying to sell, sell, and buy this because it's great on sale, that kind of stuff. And so that's how I go about monetizing it. So let's talk a bit about traffic. And I know that some of us got some articles that just hit big, big traffic and then some there's no traffic at all. So how do you guys go about figuring up great, fantastic traffic ideas? And what was the biggest traffic hit article that you ever got? Like, in my case, uh, believe it or not, the highest traffic hit article that I got was an article I wrote about a urinal. Yeah, it was the world's most high-tech urinal. It comes up from the ground, looks like a manhole, and it comes up from the ground, and they put it in uh, party areas, and it's for people, bought lots of bars nearby, and they got to go. So this thing, it's a manhole during the day, and nighttime some guy comes and comes up on the ground. It's totally uncovered, so you just go. And I guess when you're drunk, you don't care. <laughs> so, and how I did was I, 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 read, I found another book this while I was at a doctor's office. It was in a McLean's magazine. And I was just reading McLean, I go, what is this? And I decided, I kind of, what I did was I just contacted the company and said, yeah, you got this thing, can you send me more information about it? So they sent me a video and some additional press photos of this urinal that fully submerged halfway up, full way up, and they sent a video. And so I blogged about it. And it hit the front page of Dig, it, hit, it was in Gadget, it hit Slashdot, 400,000 page views in 24 hours. So that's my highest article, and that's for me, and you, you just don't know, right? So how about you, sorry? So the highest traffic article that I've had um, was 25 epic fail gifts. Um, it did a little over eight or 10 million visitors in the 24 hour period, and we pushed about four and a half terabytes of bandwidth on that day for the site. So it was, it was pretty crazy. But in terms of coming up with like article ideas and the thing that you will know that will hit, is um, I, use, I, I usually look at the trends that are going on. Like, you know, when 
Hunger, Hunger Games was, you know, going big. I looked at, you know, what's going on with Hunger Games, have one of my interns come up with an article on 25 things you didn't know about Hunger Games. And basically, I just, like, reached out to all my networks and said, okay, let's retweet this with the hashtag Hunger Games. And we retweeted it enough times that even Hunger Games saw it. And, you know, after that, it just blew up. So you have to be on top of what's happening and then you know, if, if you can somehow tie that in, because people are already searching for that, you know, you're more likely to get those backlinks. So it works well. And other times, if you can trigger emotions on one, we have a very popular YouTube following, so um, one of our readers suggested to do a 25 most brutal execution methods ever used in history, and go figure, that has so many views that you won't even believe. So it's, it, it's really up in the wind, but paying attention to what your reader wants and what the market is doing. Search.twitter.com is one of the best tools you can find. I'd say, yeah, kind of along the same lines, trends are really fun. One of our top posts was kind of around when Google Glass started out. I don't know if you guys have seen these Google Glass. They're the annoying people that have these right things. Right there, that guy right there has one. The front row. <laughs> Won't say who it is. Exactly. Um, but we did a post on the eight places Google Glass has been banned. And it, it, it's just one of those things that people are like, huh, I want to click on that. Causes that emotion, kind of going back to what Syed said. Um, but going after those type of posts, but that one ended up uh, hitting the front page of Yahoo News, um, was on Drudge, got picked up by Mashable, got picked up by TechCrunch, got picked up by CNN. Yeah. We got a lot of traffic out of it. I recently wrote an article about a pair of shoes that were uh, made in a specific way, and then it got syndicated onto Yahoo News, and it ended up getting around five to 10 million views within a day or two. And the reason why this particular article did quite well is because it's something that related to a lot of people and a lot of people don't really uh, like to see how products are made when it comes to animals or whatever. So when everybody's wearing a certain type of shoe, you're targeting to that audience and then you're actually aware of what you're wearing or whatever. And then you share it with your friends, then they share it because they wear the same shoes. So when you're writing articles that target to people's emotions like we discussed, but it's actually something that you're spending your money on and you're representing what practices might be used. And this can apply to any company, whether it's fast food or whatever you can think of. That's uh, something that's not out there and in everybody's faces. So when you write that, that's going to get shared. That's the power of viral marketing. So that's five to 10 million views just out of nowhere. Yeah, anytime you write something polarizing, it has a tendency of going viral. Except sometimes it's good viral, and sometimes it brings you bad press. So whenever, you, whenever you're trying to trigger emotion, just try to trigger the right one. And if you, if this is a very controversial topic, it's it is risky at times. Mm -hmm. like we have one article that that we just did uh, a while ago. It was called "25 Most Dangerous Dog Breeds," and um, I mean, it was it was just based on the size of the dog, and we have both sides and you know going pretty clashing and there there have been like really times where and i have dogs so there have been times i sit there and like should i really remove this article so it can, it can get you good press and bad press but a lot of traffic yeah well, <laughs> yeah one thing that i never recommend is trying to be all things to everyone usually when it comes to a topic i'm either on the extreme end of one end or the other end i'm never in the middle because uh, basically no one really wants anyone. Uh, no, but nobody likes a yes man, basically. <laughs> so let's talk oh, about. Oh, something else I wanted to point out, uh, just kind of what Syed was talking about. Everybody, like I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are thinking, well, I'm just barely getting started at this, and I don't think my my uh, blog can go this this much. I mean, for example, our blog has been around for now 10 years. Syed, how long is your blog? Your, his blog gets uh, probably five times, ten times more traffic than my do, mine uh, does. The 25 was started in November 2011. So, so that's one old. year. Two years. Two years. Yeah. Two years, less than two years ago? Yeah. A little more yeah, about, than two? Yeah, about a little over two years. About two years ago, his blog started, and like, his gets like literally... million views a month? <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like his gets ten times more traffic than mine, so it's not about like having something and writing like for years and years and years and years, although that does play a factor in it, his still gets amazing traffic. And I remember like 
literally like a year and a half and a, a year and a half ago talking to him and he's all yeah I'm starting this site and like he had more traffic than I did in like three months than my blog did like in eight years at the time so you can start off if you have trigger those emotions in people and write really good content you'll get a lot of people coming to your blog so you can start today and still get people to it Oh, one more thing I want to add is if you can find a specific industry to target, you know, doesn't have, just like find a particular audience for that one article and just target them. And then, you know, if you're new, try to reach out to other related publishers. Let's say, you know, if you are in the industry of, I don't know, physiotherapists. Like, you know, if, if you're writing an article about that, try to reach out to other, you know, magazines that can potentially link to you or um, will syndicate you, or you can guess right for them. Uh, that, will, that will tend to work. Don't pitch them in the first email. Say, hey, I had this cool research that I did, um, and would you be interested in seeing it? And just leave it at that. And you know, the, the short and sweet email it actually is much more likely to get you a response versus your long email with like two links in it, because that usually gets deleted, because it's automatically getting negated as a promotion. Mm -hmm. All right, let's talk about you know, something that uh, John just mentioned, that you know, his blog's been around for 10 years, and yet within a few months, uh, Syed gets more traffic than his blog. So John, you know, at what point do you say, you know, this isn't working out? When do we scrap this project? <laughs> <laughs> so when do I say scrap this project? I have scrapped so many projects. Um, I typically, uh, I mean, there's no like definitive like rule or something, because um, some of my projects I have not scrapped and I should have a long time ago, like 10 years ago, but I'm still working on them. Um, but I'm so passionate about them, I don't really care. Um, I would say scrap projects if one, you lose your passion. Um, for example, uh, Zach and I have started a few projects where we were really passionate about it, but then just lost passion, so we sold them. Um, we worked how long on that? Year and a half? Yeah, year and a half. Year and a half on that project. Um, I've scrapped projects after like probably like five, six months. I'd put a, a effort into it. I mean, there's no like definitive right or wrong answer, but I would say put a couple months into it and a bit of time during those couple months. And if you're still passionate about that, keep going. If you're not passionate about it, quit. Say it. Uh, sometimes, I mean, passion is the no, number one factor why I would drop any project. Like, if, you know, if I lose passion towards it, then I don't want to do it. You know, just because you can get a lot of traffic to a site, uh, and if you, you know, start hating yourself and you don't want to do it, it seems like a chore, then I'd probably sell it or I'll get rid of it, period. So, and, you know, sometimes you think you can do it and you're passionate about it and you're, like, kind of lying to yourself, convincing yourself to, because you're passionate about it because you see somebody else doing it and you think you can make a lot of money in it. But, um, you know, I would say scrap a project when you're not passionate at all. Um, or if something major happens, let's say you found something better. You know, you're like, you've been doing this for a, a while and now it's time to move on. You want to do this new thing and you, you're kind of bored out of it. Even though you're, you, you still like it, but you want to do some, pursue something bigger, then you scrap that project. Hmm. Anything add, Zach? There's like a billion ways to make money online and that's one of the biggest problems with being able to run your own business because I'll be online and I'll be like, that's a good idea. I know I can make money with that. So then I go buy a domain name, then I set up a WordPress, start adding content. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and then I realize I hate this topic and it sucks. <laughs> and then I'm stuck with a $10 order rebuild for the next 10 years because I didn't get rid of the domain name. So <laughs> multiply that by 400 and that's my problem. That's why I married a psychologist <laughs> to treat my impulse buying habits. <laughs> Yeah, my, my current project is uh, I register a domain name called myaspiritate.com and youraspiritate.com. Uh, my idea is to turn that into a site where people can enter their birthday, their health, and that kind of stuff. And it's going to predict when you're going to die. So that's your aspiry date, right? And we're going to turn that into a, 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 some kind of iPhone app so it can remind you every day to do something because you only got this many days to live. <laughs> So uh, I'm trying to find a developer to create this, but I'm not sure it's going to actually do the work, and people don't want to be minded when they're going to die. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <you know. laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we've both been in the industry for quite a long time now, and we, we get emails every single day, and some of the emails are, well, the questions are kind of on the strange end, and I want to talk about maybe just as a kind of, some kind of comic relief, some of the dumbest email we ever received. Like, uh, uh, my one would have to be, see, uh, generally the emails I receive, the dumb emails I receive generally go into three categories. There's the, uh, the begging email, where it just asks me for money. And then there's the irres irresistible offer, where they make an offer. They say, hey, I registered johnchow.info. I'm willing to turn it over to you. You develop it, and we'll split the money 50-50. And that's the irresistible offer, I get those. And then there's just a plain dumb email. And, the dumb e and what I'm doing is, I, I, see, I, I don't delete them, I collect them, and it's in, it goes into a dumb email folder. And then one day I'm going to publish this as a book, it's going to be called the Dear John Letters. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I guess an example of the, but off the top of my head, the dumbest email I get to receive related to blogging would be someone email me and says, uh, if I start a blog, how many posts do I get? Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I reply. I reply back. You get two. Hello world. And this is an example of about page. So, so I, I answer. So, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who we are guys here. So I want to say, you got an example. So, I mean, I run WP Beginner. So you know, it's a targets a lot of beginners. So, I've gotten this email not from one person, actually several times, where it's like, I lost my blog URL. So how do I log in? <laughs> How do I know? I received that. I think that guy emailed me because I got the same one. <laughs> uh, I got a naked photo from somebody last week. It's probably the most embarrassing for him. It's probably the worst email I've ever gotten. It was accidentally sent to the wrong person. <laughs> I know this person. Yeah. I don't know. Mine aren't really that funny. <laughs> but I get people that email me asking if I can uh, make examples out of them. Like, they're doing me a favor by asking if I can mentor them for a year and then turn them into a, a big blog. And then I can say that I did that for them. So I get that a lot. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. Uh, getting back on track. Let's talk about stats tracking. Now, other than Google Analytics, which everyone should be using to track their, their blog, are there any other uh, programs that you recommend to, uh, to this audience here? Um, it depends on what you're trying to track. In most cases, for blogs, Google Analytics does just about everything. And if you know how to use get Google Analytics, it is one of the most powerful platforms out there. So it really depends on what you're trying to track. Uh, you know, Raven Tools is a good solution if you're trying to track your search results. Uh, if you are trying to, to track conversions and stuff, you can try using something like Kissmetrics. But in most cases, when you're trying to do those type of micro analytics, you know you have you must have a really really good reason because in most cases it doesn't matter. You know <laughs> if you're just a blog, if you're doing product sales and you want to optimize your conversions and all that, then it's worth going further. But you know in most cases Google Analytics will give you everything you need. I'm Google Analytics. I've tried pretty much everything out there. Nothing's quite as robust as Google Analytics. Pretty much does everything. I mean, it doesn't do everything exactly how you want it, but overall it does the best job, and you don't have to log into 50 places. I don't really care that much about stats. It depends what type of blog you have. If you're a blog that's selling stuff, obviously you want to know where people came from, what's converting the best. But if you have a blog that's a hobby, it's nice to know how many people are coming to your website reading stuff, but it doesn't really matter. And then if you have a, another blog that's from my aspect, it's purposeful for branding, I just want exposure everywhere. And I just always want an increased amount of people coming to my website. So I'll be guest blogging on as many websites as possible. I'll be responding to people through Twitter and social networks. I'll be speaking at events like this. And all that comes back to making the blog bigger in the end. So I'm not focusing heavily on software and tracking and stuff like that, but I know that the blog is continually growing just because of all the work and time that I'm putting into it. Okay. Talk about a bit about videos. Like, uh, you know, blogging is mostly a reading medium, but uh, video blogging seems to be getting bigger. Uh, do you recommend people in the audience here get into video blogging? Uh, yes, and yes, and yes, and multiply that by one million times. Uh, because, one, people are spending more and more time 
on video, especially for sites like List25, we're seeing good results. Uh, second, YouTube is the second largest search engine on the, on this planet. So, and Google is owned by Google, so obviously, you know, Google prefers it. So, if you have a video, um, you have a good chance of ranking higher than a lot of even established blogs like this guy's over here depending if your video has a lot of views and so on. But it's definitely a good platform to grow. For, to give you an example, like List25 started out as a blog, okay? Um, and I, I basically made a goal, I wanna grow simultaneously across multiple platforms. So I said, okay, well, I wanna grow on Tumblr, I wanna grow on YouTube, I wanna grow on this, just like as an experiment. And all what I did on YouTube was took the images that I use in my articles for the 25 things and basically read the article. Uh, and it was an image slideshow with a voice re a voiceover reading it. So, and that blew up, right? So uh, how many subscribers YouTube subscribed to List25 have now? Uh, dang, it's almost 700,000, something like that. Uh, and we're growing at 50 to 80,000 new subscribers every month. Uh, last month, there was 15 million minutes of like spent watching our videos. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I really like video. I do interviews a lot. Uh, I started doing it probably about four months ago, so it's still new for me. Um, I really like it. Um, it's something for us since we teach SEO and that type of stuff. It sets us apart from our competitors because our competitors aren't doing it because um, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. So. Video for us is working in that aspect. Yeah, video is awesome, but I'm not doing any of it. So <laughs> I'm much better at writing a lot of content and getting it on high authority websites and helping people with their situations, writing tutorials to walk people through the process, but in a text format with screenshots so they can take their time and walk through it, go through slowly. That'll get shared virally. As long as you're creating great content, people will share it. Video is awesome, but I know it's not for everybody. Not everybody likes getting in front of the camera. You don't want to have to learn how to do everything, upload it, throw it onto YouTube, share it with your friends. So everybody else is killing it with video, but I'm just letting you know you don't have to focus on it. It definitely takes a lot of time. And my advice to you, if you're new, don't be a perfectionist. You're not, you know, you're not a celebrity and you're not like you weren't you don't have the experience on a TV ready, you're gonna get better as you go along. You can start with your, I mean, your iPhone mic uh, and then work your way onward if you like doing it, you know, keep on doing it and you will get better at it. It, it will become easier, but it's, not, it's definitely not easy in the beginning. Just don't kill yourself too hard on mm -hmm. the quality. Yeah, one of the uh, common trends you're gonna find as you progress is you're gonna fail and we all have failed before. So what I want to talk to you, what I want to ask now is like, how do you rebound from those failures? And so like, because um, I, basically I forgot, I, I stopped counting the number of times I failed, so, but it's not so much as failing, know that you're gonna fail, I know I'm gonna fail. The question is how do you respond to it, so say it. I'll laugh about it. <laughs> if I don't, I'll probably go punch a wall or something. <laughs> but um, you, can't, you can't hold yourself down, you know. It's like when you start walking, you fell. When you start riding the bike, you fell. And the best thing is learn how to get back up from it. Um, and, you know, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you're, you're going to. You know, you, you have that drive and you can't lose that drive. And failure is, you know, one of those things that will say, okay, no, maybe, I, you know, I picked the wrong niche altogether. I probably should have gone to school and became a doctor, like my parents told me. But, you know, after that, you're like, oh, well. Now I make like a crap load more than most doctors will ever in their entire lifetime, so um, maybe a good decision. I would just say, I mean, for me, <laughs> I like going on runs. So I go, anytime I have mini fails, I go on a run to run, at, run it out or I watch movies. Those are my mini fails. Um, if I fail like big, just gotta suck in, get over your pride, get back out there. Get flexible. Yeah, you're gonna fail a lot in this industry and every second of the day. You send out an email, ask if you can guest post blog on someone's website and they say no, that's a fail. You create a website that was making 800,000 in one year and then goes down to $2 the next one. True story. So uh, it's all a matter of just finding out what's next and the only way to do that is by failing. So you never know what's next and for every 20 projects I work on, maybe one works, maybe one out of every hundred, but it's that one product or project that makes up for the last thousand. 
Uh, I want to add one more thing. Surround yourself with positive people. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you have negative people all around you, you after every failure you have, you're, you know, they're going to say, oh, you should, you should have done this. And, you know, every, everybody can look back and point out all the mistakes you made and what caused it. But, you know, so hindsight is twenty twenty. Surround yourself with positive people, good friends, you know, reach out to them. Like, I reach out to all these guys. I reach out to several people that I know in the audience, like the guy with the Google Glass and uh, several others. So, uh, so, yeah, you know, make a good group of friends, you know, when you attend conferences and continue that relationship, foster that relationship. It will help you when you fail because, you know, they will help you rebound. They are there for your support. All right, awesome. Let's talk a bit about traffic. Uh, you know, obviously nothing happens on the web without traffic. So what are some of your best traffic sources, either free or paid? And do you, do you favor one over the other? Oh, goodness. Uh, I mean, in the beginning, social traffic. I mean, still social traffic is big. It, it really depends on what you're doing. Some, some, some months, Facebook will be the top one, and other months, Twitter. Uh, every time when Pinterest takes over, you know, we have one thing going viral and has like over 100,000 repins and likes, it's going to get you a lot of traffic. Um, recently, I'm really liking the Google Plus communities. It's becoming one of my uh, most favorite source of traffic because it's so easy, and not many people are utilizing it. So not and, and you know unlike unlike Facebook where you can spend hours and hours and like trying to boost engagement and then at the end of the day start, still end up having to pay Facebook to boost your posts or whatnot, it's much easier to um, you know go on Google Plus, join the communities, become a part of that community, and then leverage that community to grow your own brand. So um, right now, I would say my favorite source of traffic uh, has to be Google Plus. My favorite source is Google. But, obviously. Um, but as far as social traffic, uh, it really depends. For Search Engine Journal, we get a lot from Twitter, a lot um, of our traffic from Twitter. Uh, for Organize.com, which is our e-commerce, um, I love Pinterest because women love to organize stuff. Uh, to tell you how much, uh, we put up one uh, pin. Uh, if, if you guys don't know what Pinterest is, you're living in a cave. Go figure it out. Um, just joking. Uh, it really depends on what you guys are trying to push. Again, this one, uh, we put up a product on Pinterest. So far, it has 1.8 million repins. Uh, it drives, on average, around $400 a day worth of revenue to our company. That's just from one product off Pinterest, 100% Pinterest. So Pinterest works really well. Um, Twitter works really well for SCJ, but Organize, it does not do anything. We put so much effort into it. Um, but it has never, um, in nine months, delivered one sale. Oh, wow. So, and we tweet 34 times a day. <laughs> and it's never done $1. But on SEJ, it's where a lot of our traffic and it does a lot more than one dollar. So, what's your secret about Pinterest? Um, my secret? I have a whole session on that. Yeah. Um, no, uh, <laughs> secrets on Pinterest is um, really post stuff up that people like. Uh, borders do really well. We experiment with borders. Typically, uh, checker borders around products do better. Uh, black and white checker don't experiment with colors. We get, I mean, I've done tons and tons of research on that. Um, posts, if you're uh, kind of a mommy blogger or doing kind of list things, if you post together a big long list and then put each one of the pictures in there and put inspiring things in there, those typically go a lot more viral. Um, and get a lot more pins. And pins, we found, helps SEO a lot. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a do follow link, huh? From yeah. Pinterest. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think don't. so, yeah. So. Uh, I'd say my favorite traffic source is personal recommendations. So I don't care if it's from somebody here who I talked with and then they told somebody else. That's worth a thousand times more than someone finding my link in the search engine. So whether it's through a guest blog post or testimonial recommendation, anything like that. That's the type of traffic I want. But it's also important to look at your traffic in three different ways. I had a website way back in the day that was a, a social website that got a massive amount of traffic and ended up doing 800,000 in profit in four months. But 
it was getting over 100,000 uniques a day, but each visitor to the website was making a very small amount of money. Now, every person that goes to John's website, they're actually making a lot of money because they're interested in purchasing stuff. So the traffic doesn't matter if it's more or less, it's how you monetize that. And again, personal recommendations are most important to me because the people who are coming to my website want to actually work with me, want to associate with the brand. So that could equate to me having new sponsors or new ventures that I could work with. So don't look at your traffic as that you have to get a million visitors or you need a thousand. It's how you actually use that traffic. Okay, I was just given the 15 minute warning bell. So if you, uh, what I want to do now is I want to turn over to the audience. So if you have a question, I said start going up on to the mic and I'll ask my final question while you people are going up there. And that basically is, when did you first realize that your blog became an authority? Uh, and what were some of the indications that you so became an authority? You, you, you know, like you, get, you start getting press at you know, larger publications, for example, like Wired Magazine or uh, Mashable, but then you start wondering, is it one off and so on, and then you start seeing them come regularly. And I think for me, one of the bigger moments was uh, LinkedIn came out with their uh, official LinkedIn count button, and like as soon as they came out with it, I wrote an article about it really, really fast, how to add a LinkedIn uh, button in WordPress. So before the LinkedIn blog post could even go up. So when they wrote their blog post, they linked to WP Beginner saying, if you want to learn how to add it in WordPress, here's the article. So I, at that point, I was like, huh, I guess people are following us. So uh, yeah. yeah. So searching your journal, I guess, when do you realize that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say me personally, when I realized like I became sort of thing is when people really started bashing me. <laughs> because that means they're paying attention to what I'm saying. So. That's a good indicator. Yeah. yeah. Uh, every day you get realization in the world of internet marketing and blogging that more people are listening to you and paying attention. And just even have one person come up to me at this event and say, wow, it's, it's Zach Johnson, I read your blog. That means the world to me. And th that is the same core that I've had through my whole business for the past 18 years that I don't care if you have a million readers on your blog or one visitor on your blog, I'll still take the time to talk to you. I'll write a guest post. It's all about that personal relationship. So just knowing that there's people out there that actually care what I say and have an impact on their lives, that, that means a lot to me. So that means I made it. Okay, let's go to the audience. And uh, the, the rule here is no questions, dumb questions. So it's okay. We're not going to add you to my, my email list or whatever. Also, <laughs> also, bring on hard questions. Like, if you guys have questions, hard question, like, any type of question you want. Bring like, on, like, personal question, I mean, I'll answer fine. anything. I won't hold anything back. So The more specific to your website, it's probably going to help you the most. That's so. right. If you want to ask something specific to what your specific problem is, we're more than happy. So, go. That's the question. So my question centers on personal branding <clears throat> and business branding. I'm doing both, and my question is, if, if I'm doing both, what is the one thing or, well, the top three or five things I need to keep in mind in building my personal brand and business brand at the same time? Ah. Well, how are they associated to each other? Uh, Kim Beasley Consulting is associated with Kim Live TV. So Kim Live TV does Google Plus production. Kim Beasley Consulting does Google Plus speaking. So that's how they are tied together. Well, I would search out all the top authority blogs and people that are well known within your industry and try and guest blog on their website and use your personal branding for that. So you become the authority in that. And then if you have the business is where all of your transactions and business actually comes from, you're going to pass them through to that. So you want to be out there as the know-all for what you're talking about. And then people will start to come to you, and then they'll follow up, and you can redirect them to your business. So I wouldn't focus so much on branding your business, but your personal brand instead, because that's what's going to be more important. Like nobody knows who the agencies are for Brad Pitt, all the big uh, celebrities out there. You're going to go to Brad Pitt and ask, who are you using? So you're the authority, and they're going to come to you directly. So focus on your personal brand and the business brand will grow behind it. Yeah. One of the best way to build your personal brand, get published. <laughs> Write a book. Because uh, when, when I, I, I have a free ebook, which I eventually turned into a published book that was actually published by a New York publisher. And in that one moment, I went from ebook peddler 
to publish author. And that title will elevate your brand so high, suddenly you become the instant expert because you have a published work. And it used to be very, very hard and expensive. You need a, New York, you need a publisher, you need everything. But today, mm -hmm. with stuff like CreateSpace from Amazon, uh, you can take your work, create a published book, sell one copy, and you can say it's a bestseller. <laughs> uh, and, but the thing is, to have something physical that you can say, uh, your name, author of. Once I, turn it, once I create a published work, the interview increased. I was given an opportunity to do keynotes. I was invited to Germany to speak. It's amazing. And the cost of it today, uh, there's no reason for you not to have a published work. I, actually, I want to put a twist on it. I actually did the exact opposite. Um, instead of focusing on my personal brand, I built a brand. Because before Facebook, who knew Mark Zuckerberg? OK. Before Microsoft, who knew Bill Gates? You don't, right? So instead, instead of like building out a personal blog, which I was doing at the time, I, I almost neglected my personal brand. Um, I had a Twitter account. That was my personal brand. And then I focused a lot of my writing on uh, WP Beginner. And at the time, like, people didn't know me, but they knew that I was the WP Beginner guy. As a matter of fact, I was in St. Louis, and you know, I was giving a talk. And then all of a sudden, uh, like, I'm seeing tweets going out on the hashtag that the WP Beginner guy is here. And next thing you know, I have like more than two dozen people surrounding me saying, oh, I, you know, I started um, my blog because of your site, and I learned so much from it. So I, I had the exact opposite. And once I had my brand you know, through WP Beginner, you know, as, as WP Beginner grew, because I could add much more value through WP Beginner than through my personal blog talking about me racing you know, Ferraris or whatnot. Um, work, so I, I found it the other way working out much better. And then once I had established brand as, as my company, then I start focusing on my personal brand. And now you know, I have writer profiles at Huffington Post and several other notable uh, you know, publications because I have proven myself with a company. So, okay. Hi, um, I have a question. What? Speak uh, up. Sorry. No. Um, what advice, or what what would you uh, say to affiliate managers? Do you have any advice for them, or th things you'd want to say to them based on your experience with with them, and how to make them uh, be better partners with you? Sure. Don't send me an email saying you have a hundred thousand dollar or more a month opportunity for me because I'm <laughs> definitely not interested in that. Okay. Um, try to be as personal as possible. You know, your first email probably shouldn't even be a pitch, right? Um, a lot of times, actually, I found, I found this one company, they, they sent me an email saying, oh, um, you know, you're doing really good work. And the next thing that, you know, that, that, was, that was the first email, and I think they might have asked a question. And after that, they sent a tweet where uh, they mentioned me and then retweeted an article. So you know, I'm going to remember that much more than an email because I'm getting tons and tons of um, you know, emails. And I'm, I don't have the time to thoroughly read all of them, whereas the tweet is only 140 characters. So I, I would see that. And then the more, you know, if, if you can go make a one-on-one -on -one interaction like you know, here, and you, you, yeah, as long as you can add some sort of value back to them, aside from that you know, dollars that you're going to pay them after they make a sale for you, um, it's going to be much better. And if, if you can make people feel special, it's a big thing now, uh, and I, I recently did a post about Moto X and how the motor, just a motor maker giving the user the ability to customize, okay. is, it makes them feel special. So if you can do something in, in that line and offer a customized experience, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I would just say real quick, um, no affiliate out there, no affiliate network out there is the best. None have the top payouts, so they can all stop saying that. And Please. if they really want to make an association with their affiliates, don't say, these are the top offers on the network. Say, this is how to promote them. This is what's working. Provide a full case study, tutorials, because anybody could just log into the network and say, hey, these are the top offers. So obviously, the personal relationship is also there. So learn what you can about the top people. Like People will send me stuff that they know that I talk about on the blog, and that'll gain me their attention. So I'll listen to their email, and they don't fall into the mix of everybody else who's just spamming me. I'd, I'd say stand out. Um, one network, won't say who it is, um, sent me a letter with $1,000 bills in it. And they said, I want 30 minutes of your time. I know your time's valuable. Can I get 30 minutes? Cool. And they paid me for my time. OK. Because they know me opening up my time is very valuable. So that's how much my time was worth to them. 
and it got them a meeting. And now I push them lots of traffic. Okay. Uh, another thing is that you know when I when I was like talking a lot about my personal blog and stuff. Um, you, if, if you can stand out, like they're, they're saying, one of the networks actually, you know, they knew that I had a little brother, he was like four years old. So mm -hmm. they like create a whole package kit and send it yeah. to him instead of me. Uh, nice. And, yeah. and, and that, that, that got the attention because they're like, yeah. you know, it, it, he had a shirt and like a bunch of games and the, like teddy bears that said, oh, like, all said like future blogger and all that. And you're like, oh wow, they actually, you yeah. know, went that extra step. Sure. And it probably didn't cost them a lot of money. Sure. Yeah, I was targeted by that same company. They sent everything to my daughter, Sally. Yeah. <laughs> gave her a little teacher that says future blogger, gave her Hello Kitty doll, and it was all indirect marketing, yeah. I guess, so it get to get to me. But it just showed that the company did the research and they yeah. found out if I had any relatives or any other siblings. And uh, so, and it got, it got my attention and uh, definitely got them business. Okay, great answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hiya. Um, Personal branding, how have you handled negative things against your brand? Is there any times where you've just thought, fuck, uh, and how have you dealt Daily. with that? Daily. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do it all the time. So. I mean, you know, you're going to make bloopers all the time. And somebody's, like, you're not going to please everybody, right? So a lot of times, if, if it's something too out, far-fetched, then I don't even acknowledge it. Um, at other times, people are completely mistaken, and they're they're making up things. And in in those cases, you know, I would I would reach out to the blogger, or tweet it, or, and or even go and comment and and give a very lengthy thing, which is you know very genuine and authentic. You know, from from me explaining everything and not saying you're an idiot and you didn't do your research, but kind of saying it in a more polite way. Yeah, I find that negative stuff most of the time is never as bad as you think it is. And a lot of time, the best response is just not even to reply to it, just let it go. And uh, it will eventually just die down, like uh, the heat. And peop peop people, on the, especially on the web, people on the web have very, very short memories. <laughs> right, so they, I mean, so I'm sure that then no one remembers that I was banned from Google three years unless I actually mentioned it. Hi guys, uh, I know you guys spoke about uh, failures earlier. I, had a, I wanted to find out what's your take on, let's say you, you, you started a site, you get a modest amount of traffic, but the URL is not really conducive to where you want to push now, uh, your focus is. So you want to you wanna start redirecting to, uh, you've bought another URL that's more, more focused as to where you want to go. If, if you're getting a modest amount of traffic, what's the tipping point? I mean, where would you say it's not worth redirecting? Just go, just start from scratch somewhere else, or is there a tipping point, in other words? Well, I say if you have the traffic already coming in, there's no reason to abandon that traffic if you just set up a redirect and just go to your new site. But it's, it's, a, lot of, um, it's a lot of content, but the traffic is not, it, it's a very modest amount of traffic versus the amount of content that's on the site. So, it, you know, it's labor intensive to do it. It's a very like interesting, in, like very personal decision you have to make with your business because what what is your goal? Why are you trying to switch? What's going on with your current traffic? Why are you not making enough money? Uh, why is is the repositioning going to make you that much more? Um, so there's a lot of questions that you need to be asking yourself before you even think about redirecting. I mean, you know, redirect. Sure, I I, I can get traffic over. Um, I, I set up a 301 to every single page. I move all the articles over. I can probably get the Google you know juice to be back up in six months, three months, depending. Um, but is it worth it? it you know, you you have you have to really have a very good plan in place. That you, how do you know your next one is not gonna have the same pitfalls as the one before? So. Oftentimes, like you know, why didn't John create a new brand and, and, and you know create a site that he could actually sell rather than just stuck with JohnChow.com, right? So you have to you have to make a plan and see if it makes sense because that sometimes it doesn't make sense to do a you know a 360 turn. Maybe a little tweak here and there can do the job. Thank you. That's good. Last, I think last question. Yeah. Yeah. You got the last question. Quick. Hi right, guys. Um, you know, real quick, if you guys, if it wasn't about passion and it was just about business and you were looking to start in a new vertical or go after a market in the blogging thing, what, markets, what market would you guys go after? Do I have morals? Huh? Do I have morals? No moral, just business. It's all business. <laughs> <laughs> all business. Uh, I, I would 
basically stick with the stuff that's never going to go well. Like, let's just face it. Everyone wants to make more money. Everyone wants to want to lose weight. Everyone's going to want to attract members of the opposite sex. If you st and I'm not really worried about competition. I really think that there's a rough space, enough room for everybody. Right? So uh, if I were to do a new niche, I would just stick with the ones that's going to be never going to go out of style or that's always going to be in demand. Cause the one I just mentioned before, like the making money, losing weight, uh, attracting members of opposite sex, they will never go out. They'll never, it will always be a market for that. Personal development, always going to be a market for that. Personal development is probably something I would like to get into because it's impossible to achieve perfection. So the customer is for life. <laughs> uh, I, I would say just I not worry about the business part, go more for the passion part because if you're doing it just for money and it doesn't go right in three weeks, you're going to be, you're not going to go with it. So I would stay, I would stick with the passion. I often say that about myself that I'm a perfect consumer. Uh, so I usually try, whenever I create something, I'm trying to solve a problem and usually it is my own problem and I think it's a, usually it's a big problem. Um, and I mean, how did List 25 come about? I, I was in Europe and I was visiting castles and I was like, man, somebody should have a website about 21 you know, things you should do at this castle. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna be traveling all that much, so I don't wanna be that fake guy who writes these you know, articles, so why not create a list site? Because I like these things and they all go away because you know, sometimes they didn't pay the hosting bill, they get tired of it. Create a site that entertains me. Um, so most of the things I create uh, has to do something with what I'm doing right now. I would focus on going after big business because it's much easier to get large companies to spend $10,000 and to have to get 300 people to sign up for something at $30 each. And once you have a brand established, huge money is huge money. So you go after big companies and they will gladly spend what might seem like a lot of money to you, but it's very little to them. So instead of trying to sell a ton of people to make a lot of money, just go after big companies for a supply of a lot of money. Okay, and with that, that ends the session. Like I said, thank you very much. Please do fill out the form and uh, let the affiliate people know what you think of the session. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good work, Joe.